All right, we're going to pick up with cardiac output then. So if you have your worksheet handy, I think that's um, a, a nice way to take the information from the PowerPoint and be able to kind of condense it and see what the big picture items are. So have this worksheet handy, and we'll be working on this together. So first of all, um, we're not going to do capillary dynamics right off the bat. So turn the page in your packet to uh, the next page that is dealing with factors that affect cardiac physiology. And the first one is cardiac output. So cardiac output is defined as the volume of blood pumped by each ventricle in a minute. So the stronger your heart can contract, the more blood it's going to pump out. Would everybody agree with that? Okay. And how fast your heart is contracting, which is your heart rate, would also affect how much goes out in a minute. Would you agree with that? So I equate it to you have a pitcher of lemonade and you're serving some friends. What's in the pitcher? What do we call that, what's in the pitcher? We talked about it last time a little bit. At the, end of, at the end of ventricular relaxation, we have this volume of blood that's going to be pumped out of the heart. What do we call that volume at the end of relaxation? It's called the end diastolic volume, EDV. Remember we talked about that last time, end diastolic volume? So that's what's in the pitcher. It's my pitcher of lemonade. Now I have a minute to serve up lemonade to my friends. Right? So I'm going to, the more I fill glasses, right, that would be like the heart rate. How many times I tip the pitcher would be my heart rate. Would you agree with that? So the more people I'm serving, the more I'm going to leave, the more that's going to leave the pitcher. So what's in the pitcher to start out with would be like end diastolic volume. And how much I serve would be cardiac output. How much I serve in a minute. So the more times I'm uh, tipping the pitcher, that would be heart rate. And then the other part of the equation, stroke volume, what is that in the picture? Nope, that's end systolic volume. Yeah, how much is in the cup, right? After a minute, how much I've served in a minute, how much has left the heart? I'm sorry, that's not, no, 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 no. How much I'm serving each person, right? That would be my stroke volume. So every time I tip the pitcher, so with each beat, how much leaves the heart, that's stroke volume. And we kind of talked about that last time. Okay, so heart rate and stroke volume are both factors that we use to calculate cardiac output. So the higher the heart rate, what happens to stroke volume? Why do you say decreases, Erica? And why is that? You're right. Well, yeah, it's not relaxing long enough to fill. Right. So I'm pumping out less if I have a really high heart rate. So these two are inversely related. Would you agree? So the slower the heart rate, the larger the stroke volume within a given range, obviously. Okay, so what affects cardiac output then are heart rate and stroke volume. So if we go to our worksheet, the formula or the, the um, definition is given in your PowerPoint. I'm not going to type that for you. You can copy it from the PowerPoint. But the normal value for a healthy adult male is 5.25 liters in a minute. Okay, so per minute. So what is it affected by? We said it was for adult, yeah, all in all A and P textbook, it always is a young adult male in his 20s. So Brett, is that you? <laughs> okay. All right. So heart rate we said, and stroke volume. So the formula then, from your PowerPoint, is cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. And what do we say about the heart rate? If I have a high heart rate,
And we already talked about the definition of stroke volume last time, but we'll just talk about it again here. So going back to our PowerPoint. So let's just finish up talking about cardiac output before we go into stroke volume in more detail. So the maximum cardiac output is four to five times the resting cardiac output in non-athletic people. So if you are athletic, why would you have a better cardiac output? A stronger heart. The heart is a muscle. So if I want to develop my bicep and make it contract more forcefully, I just work it, right? I, I lift a, a dumbbell and I just work it. And then over time it becomes more able to lift heavier weights because it can contract with each lift of my dumbbell, it can contract more forcefully so I can start adding weights to my dumbbell, right? So this, the heart is the same way. When we exercise it with aerobic activity in that training zone of 55 to 85% of your maximum heart rate, when we exercise it, it contracts more forcefully. So every time it contracts, it squeezes out more blood. So what factor is that? that we talked about is that example of, so when it squeezes out with each beat, is that stroke volume, cardiac output, or heart rate when I talk about squeeze per beat? Stroke volume. So if my stroke volume is really efficient because I've got a heart, uh, a healthy heart that's well exercised, what happens to heart rate then? It goes down because with every beat, my heart is more efficient at expelling blood and serving my tissues. So that's why people that are athletic have a lower resting heart rate because their heart is just really good at delivering blood with each beat. So if a person is not athletic, lives a sedentary lifestyle, we would expect their resting heart rate to be higher because their heart is not well trained and it has to beat more to get that energy out or to get that blood out to give energy to the tissues. So it's important as we age to keep our heart you know, conditioned. And they've done recent research now saying that the loss in cardiac function we see with age, um, maximum resting or maximum heart rate does decline with age, but as far as the ability of the heart to contract during exercise actually um, does not decline with age like they thought. It's not that rapid decline. They think the number one reason for the decline we do see in the general population is due to lack of exercise. People slow down. People tell you, oh, you're getting old. You can't do that as well anymore. Or you start, you know, you're exercising and you find, oh, gosh, I'm just not as good as I used to be. It's because I'm getting old. So do we put as much of an effort in then because we know we're getting old? No. Same thing they say with pregnancy. Oh, once you have kids, you gain weight and it's just a lost cause. Not true. Yes, you gain weight with pregnancy, and yes, you have to work to get that, that weight off after pregnancy, but kids do not change your metabolism and make you heavy. That's a, that's a myth. It's the lack of activity that happens with kids, because once you get a baby, now you're you know, taking care of the baby, you can't get out and exercise as much, you're sitting with the baby, um, you're serving when they're toddlers, what kind of foods do baby, toddlers, preschoolers like to eat? Are they going to eat your you know, chicken breast with broccoli and a salad with balsamic vinegar on the side? No. So you're making mac and cheese, peanut butter and jelly. You're making snacks for birthdays, right? You're eating cookies. And mom and dad are eating those foods just right alongside their kids. So eating habits change after having kids. So it's really a, you have to make that effort. And the same thing happens with our heart. If we want to keep it contracting and keep our cardiac output good and keep a, a good stroke volume, we have to exercise that heart. And it doesn't mean crazy exercise, right? We're just saying 30 minutes most days of the week. And it doesn't even have to be at one time. You could do 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the afternoon. How many times do we spend 15 minutes watching a senseless infomercial on television, right? So we have 15 minutes you know, in the morning and in the afternoon in our day. It's just a matter of making it a priority. And the quality of life then as a person gets older is so much higher when they have built in exercise into their lifestyle. Okay, so, um, so cardiac output actually goes up then because our hearts are more e efficient with exercise. So stroke volume then is next on your worksheet, and that's the amount, the volume of blood that leaves the heart. Cardiac output is, involves a time, it's per minute. So stroke volume and cardiac output are really very closely related. Each beat, yeah, stroke volume is per beat. So you can write that definition on your worksheet. And the three things that affect stroke volume are preload, contractility, and 
afterload. And this will be a guaranteed test question. So normal volume for or normal value for stroke volume. Do you remember what that is? End diastolic is 120. And systolic, so after the heart is contracted, what's left in the heart is 50. So therefore, normal value is 70 milliliters. Someone said, was that liters? That would be a big heart <laughs> and a big body to handle all that. So the formula then is stroke volume equals end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume. So a lot of people get thrown off by preload and afterload. What the heck is that stuff, right? So I put a little diagram in the corner here. Preload is the amount of blood entering the ventricles. And afterload is the resistance that the ventricles have to overcome to get that blood out of the heart. So let's talk about what that means. So preload, so the amount entering the ventricles, where is that coming from? Where is that blood coming from? What? Someone said it? Pulmonary veins would be one. Pulmonary veins. What side of the heart does that come from or go into? The left, so pulmonary veins. And what's feeding the right ventricle at the same time? Superior vena cava and inferior vena cava, right? So. All that we call venous return. So what leaves the heart with cardiac output in a minute should come back to the heart, right? If the system and the we have good functioning tissues, right? We have a little bit that we lose to the lymphatic vessels, but for the most part, what goes out should come back in if we have a functioning system. So the amount of blood coming back is called preload. So that's, and just think of that, preload, it's what the ventricles have to overcome. Before they even contract, they've got to overcome this pressure to get that blood out. So we call afterload, um, when they're contracting, what they have to overcome to leave the, the vessels. And what are the vessels? So it's the amount leaving the ventricles through what? What vessels do they have to leave through? Aorta and pulmonary artery, or pulmonary, yeah, arteries. Okay, so if we look at these two values then, what is something that could cause an increased afterload? Making the heart work harder. So you said the blood is leaving the aorta. Think of the aorta and all of its branches. What could be happening out there that would make my heart have to uh, squeeze that blood harder to get it through those vessels? A clot, definitely. What did you say? Constriction. Do we have narrowing vessels here in the United States among our population? Definitely. You've heard of atherosclerosis, right? Hardening of the arteries. Yeah, so anytime we have any kind of constriction or um, narrowing of arteries that will increase our afterload. So that's hard on the heart. So it's got to contract with more force to get that blood out. And that's what contractility is a measurement of. It's the force of contraction. So what did we say will increase contractility? What can we do? If we want to increase the contractility of our heart, what can we do? Right. So exercise increases contractility. Heart failure is when over time you've got this high blood pressure you're trying to overcome, and that leads to the other thing that increases after load, is when I have narrowing of vessels, that increases my blood pressure, right? So high blood pressure which we call hypertension, that's the fancy word for it, increases afterload. And that high blood pressure could be because of narrowed arteries, constricted arteries. It also could be because I have too much blood volume 
in my blood vessels because they have a high salt diet, so I've got extra fluid in my blood vessels, so there's just more to push. So that's going to increase that. So the amount entering the ventricles, venous return, what would cause a low venous return? What would cause less blood coming back? What'd you say? Okay, so what would cause low blood pressure? What? Dehydration, definitely. Dehydration. Bleeding, right? It's leaving the space, leaving the vessels and entering the tissues. And what happens if I have too much pressure in my um, vessels and I have low albumin, water follows solute, so if I don't have enough solute in my blood, I can lose fluid, right, into my interstitial fluid. So low blood um, plasma proteins. And there's others, but those are some examples of things that would decrease venous return. And if I decrease venous return, I decrease cardiac output, and blood pressure is going to go down eventually. Okay, so uh, we have the formula for stroke volume. Gave us the normal value. So let's go back to our PowerPoint. So um, preload is also the amount of stretch. So the more blood I have returning to the heart, would you agree that it would stretch the ventricle wall more, the more blood that's returning? Everybody agree with that? And the more we stretch the heart, the more it can contract with force. Just like if I want to lift something really heavy, I need to straighten my arms out a little bit, right? Stretch those muscle cells, and then I can uh, really lift it. But if I start trying to lift here, I can't lift as much weight, right? If I keep my arms bent higher, I need to bring them down a little more. That's the same way the heart works, is the more it's stretched, the for more forcefully it can contract. With or within a given amount, right? If I overstretch it, then it's harder to contract and it will wear out over time. So if I have increased blood volume for a really long time due to high blood pressure or too much fluid in my vessels because of a high salt diet, that can wear out the heart over time. And then that leads to a weakening and less contractility. Okay, so at rest, um, like we said, the, the muscle cells are shorter than optimal length. So when we fill it when we have increased venous return stretching the ventricles that increases the contraction force. So I would highlight this and this. A slow heart rate increases venous return. Would you agree with that? Erica gave us a good reason why. Can you tell us why again, Erica? Why a slow heart rate would increase venous return? Think of the answer. A slow heart rate. If I have, right, so it's doing what longer? Yeah, it's feeling longer, so that's more venous return, right? So venous return is the amount of blood coming back to the heart. So the more the heart is not contracting and squeezing it away, the more it's sitting there filling with blood, right? So that would increase venous return. So definitely highlight and underline those two comments here on the bottom, these two bullets. It's kind of putting it all together. And then contractility, we talked about that. Now there's certain things that increase contractility. The more calcium I have available, we find that when we stimulate the sympathetic nervous system to the heart through the cardioregulatory center we, via the medulla, we find that there's more calcium that enters those heart muscle cells, causing contraction. We know that epinephrine is part of the sympathetic nervous system, right? So if we, someone has a crashing heart, their you know, heart rate is down, blood pressure is down, we mean to speed up that heart, get it to contract more forcefully and more rapidly, we're going to give them epi by IV push, you know, straight into a, a vein question. Yeah, don't worry about inotropic agents. It just means that they act positively on the heart and they cause increased um, contractility and heart rate. So don't worry about that term. I should actually get it off of there because don't worry about that. Um, 
but I do want you to pay attention to what is the definition of contractility and that the sympathetic nervous system increases contractility. And then negative, that decrease it. I'm not going to expect you to know these things. That's a little bit more information beyond the scope of our course. These are things that I guarantee you if you ask the average nurse out on the units, they wouldn't remember this detail. This is something that doctors need to know, so I'm not going to expect you to know the chemical effects on the heart. Okay, so afterload we talked about is, you know, with that pressure and blood, high blood pressure is definitely increases afterload, so highlight that. And then, like I said, the sympathetic nervous system causes it to increase the heart rate and contractility. So the sympathetic nervous system through norepinephrine, epinephrine, increases heart rate and contractility. Because if you're going to do a fight or flight response, don't you want your heart to beat faster and harder to serve that, those working muscles? Definitely. Okay, so the effects on the heart from the parasympathetic nervous system, remember the vagus nerve feeds the SA node and the AV node, and if we don't remember that, we can just back up in our PowerPoints here. Here's the sympathetic and parasympathetic influence on the heart, so we can see the green is the sympathetic nerve, the blue is the parasympathetic nerve, which is the vagus nerve that's, that stimulates 90% of the organs with the parasympathetic fibers. So we can see that these both feed the AV nodes, but also look at the sympathetic fibers. Don't they serve the heart muscle itself? See how they stretch down? So that's where the increased contractility comes. So by influencing the nodes, that's what increases heart rate, but influencing the heart muscle itself is a sympathetic response. So the SA node, inherently, that's a pacemaker cell, right? So it's set to fire at 100 beats per minute. That's what it's autorhythmically designed to do. It drifts to threshold, remember, through those sodium channels, and fires off an action potential 100 times a minute. That's what the SA node is designed to do. But you'll notice there is this vagus nerve acting on the SA node and the AV node. And that vagal tone, we call it, just a little bit of stimulus, because the parasympathetic and sympathetic neurons are always firing action potentials, and they counteract one another. So instead of 100 beats per minute, that SA node fires at 75 beats per minute because of the vagus nerve. So it brings that level down a little bit. So this weekend, I was with some friends and playing on, on a women's basketball league, which is very competitive. And there are some tough girls that we play against. We're the oldest, you know, we have the, all the over 40 moms on our team. But we are all old athletes, so we have this really competitive edge, or urge, I should say, not edge, urge. So when we get out there, we really want to, you know, give them a run for their money. And that's our goal, is just to get them tired, the other teams, because they're all in their late 20s, early 30s, and they are ex-college basketball players. So they're really intense, flying through the air, elbowing you in the face if you get in their way. <laughs> So I'm out there, it was our first game, and I'm not used to pounding up and down the court with those high bursts of energy. So all of a sudden I notice that my heart's starting to go into this rapid, weird rhythm, and I can feel it in my throat. And that's usually AFib when that happens, and that does happen when you really stress out your heart when you're, well, not like I was gonna have a heart attack or you know sudden cardiac death, but I knew what did I need to do, to, we talked about this in class, to stimulate that vagus nerve to bring that heart rate down. Cough, did that a couple of times, didn't work. <laughs> Took myself off the court, coughed a couple hard times, didn't work. So then what did, you, did I do? Yeah, hold your breath and bear down and just increase the pressure in your chest. So you just go, just do that a couple times. I didn't make that noise, I did it quietly. I'm just, I'm just going. <laughs> and sure enough, brought it down, back on the court, run up and down. Yeah, and that worked. And I was telling a friend, actually, she did, get, she did get elbowed in the face, had a black eye and a, some skin. You know when they say put some skin in the game? She had skin underneath, the girl who got her had skin underneath her fingernail from the inside of her eye there. <laughs> so anyway, I was telling her, I said, yeah, I had to take myself out. I said, I'm not in good shape for this kind of stuff because my heart went into this really fast rhythm. She said, that is happening to me too today. <laughs> I said, well, here's what you're doing to get rid of it. So I did a little A&P lesson on the side of the court. And I said, you know, we really should all know where the AED is in this room because if we're going <laughs> to have these abnormal rhythms when we're exercising. 
but anyway, so there's a little, you know, physiology while you're living your life. Okay, so um, anyway, so we have the sympathetic speeds up the heart rate via serving the, the nodes, and it increases contractility by serving the muscle, where the parasympathetic um, only serves the, the nodes and slows the heart rate down. Okay, so back to um, another um, thing that we have is this Bainbridge reflex, which just means that when we have extra stretch of the atrial nodes, that's a reflex that acts right on the SA node to cause it to fire. Because what, what does it mean when the atrial walls are stretching? They're filling with blood. Is it time to empty those atria then and you know, get that blood into the ventricles to finish up ventricular filling? Yeah, so it's a nice mechanism that if we have increased venous return, we're gonna increase that heart rate to get it out of those atria so we don't overstretch the atria. And then we can see it stimulates the stretch receptors. Oh, wait, let me just talk about that. Yeah, so this stimulates the, the sympathetic um, nervous system. <clears throat> All right, so there's a lot of really good information in here that just talks about influences um, with exercise and how the heart kind of responds. But I think this is overwhelming. I remember looking at these in grad school and it took me a lot of time to really make sense of this. So it's there, it's from your textbook. If this helps you, great. If it doesn't, if you find it overwhelming, that's what I made this worksheet for, is so you can focus on these individually and see how they affect heart rate or cardiac output or cardiovascular function. So I'm not gonna expect you to spend time memorizing this flow chart. I'm gonna ask you things more directly off of this worksheet here, okay? So that leads us to heart rate. So if we look at heart rate, that's just the beats per minute. The definition of heart rate is beats per minute. And what influences, what affects our heart rate? Well, a couple of things. Hormones, we already talked about epinephrine will raise the heart rate. And we know thyroxine, what does that come from? Thyroid gland, and everybody agrees the thyroid drives metabolism, right? So if you have a high metabolism, would you have a higher heart rate? Or if you have a low metabolism, might you have a lower heart rate? Yeah. So thyroxine influences heart rate because it's a major driver of metabolism. So we find that people that have hyperthyroidism, one of the symptoms of that is a rapid heart rate. And those with low thyroid have a lower heart rate. And we know that ions, whoops, we know that ions affect heart rate because we, we're trying to get to that action potential, right? The more calcium that's available, the more we have the ability to rise to threshold and maintain that plateau. I'm sure, sorry, sodium gets us to threshold. Calcium maintains the, the plateau at the peak of contraction. So that affects heart rate, as long as we have enough calcium to supply that action potential. And what does potassium do to the heart? Think of the action potential. What does potassium do? Does it initiate or end the action potential? Ends it. So what is the heart doing at the end of an action potential? It's gonna be stimulated to relax, right? So if I give someone straight potassium through, their, through an IV push, which is not allowed in nursing, never should happen, I would kill my patient, right? Because I would stop their heart. We have to be very careful with potassium. We usually put it in an IV bag in a you know, smaller amount you know, to give it to them very gradually. Or we give it through the digestive tract as a pill. Um, I don't know. Somebody was telling me in class the other day that that's how they do assisted suicide was with potassium. But then they give other medications because you know it can cause. Yeah. Oh, did you? Yeah, okay, and they talked about potassium. It isn't the best. No, it's because. Yeah. That it, it oh, jeez, <laughs> spinning to death. Oh my gosh. Well, I know that, like, um, when I worked at a veterinary clinic. No, no, actually, they did to a guy to the point of almost dying. He was 
Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, that's impressive. Depressing though. Um, well, I know in the veterinary clinic they give you an overdose of uh, barbiturate, like phenobarbital. They just over, overdo it. I think that was what it was, but that was years ago. They might do something different now, but they just overdo that. So let's see. So in a lethal injection, sodium thio, okay, so that's a anesthetic. So it is, okay, so there you go. Sodium, so that puts them to sleep. Um, don't know what that does, but they're potassium chloride. So, well, I'm not going to display this because I have not pre approved that stuff. So, <laughs> but potassium chloride is part of the mix, so we can verify that. Anyway, so um, our ion concentration really regulates heart rate. So when people have arrhythmias, the first thing they're going to look at, the doctor, is what is the electrolyte panel on this patient? Do we have irregularities? And potassium is number one for heart irregularities as far as the most common cause of an arrhythmia among elderly patients because their kidneys aren't working as well, and sometimes they're on something, uh, a water pill, to help their blood pressure, and that water pill causes them to increase urination, and sometimes some of those medicines cause them to pee away potassium. So we tell patients on those medicines to um, eat bananas, potatoes. Bananas and potatoes are good sources of potassium. But you got to be careful with the bananas because that constipates elderly people. Bananas are very constipating. So we think of them as healthy, but they're actually a little higher in sugar and fat and are constipating. So bananas are not a great choice unless you're like a you know, big athlete and you know, you're eating a lot of good foods and getting exercise, you have good bowel function, then go ahead and eat lots of bananas. But because they're easy to digest, yeah, yeah, and people like them. They're easy to chew, easy to swallow. They're you know palatable. But people like the way they taste, yeah. And it, it's good sources of potassium, so that's all that's good. And that's why most people are on laxatives anyway, though, because of slowing bowels and sitting in chairs all day and eating mushy nursing home food, right? <laughs> Oh, yeah. Mm, all those things that are hard on the gut. Yeah, right, I know. Well, mandarin oranges are a great thing to feed the elderly people because they are soft, they are good on the bowel, and they're high in vitamin C. But I think they're expensive or, I don't know, I don't see them served a whole lot. Yeah, and everybody likes them. I give them to my kids. Anytime anybody's having issues, we ramp up the canned pineapple and the mandarin oranges, and that really helps people, helps the kids keep things moving because you know when you get busy you're doing McDonald's and you know crappy foods chicken nuggets and french fries macaroni and cheese and all those things just kill you know the the gut and busy little kids I've had to give my one son um, lots of high fiber foods to keep him moving all right so other things that affect heart rate age we know as we age what happens to our heart rate as we age goes up or down goes down it goes down so when you look at your little 90-year-old lady and she has a heart rate of 50, that's not because she's you know, well exercised and has a great heart. <laughs> so gender, who has a higher heart rate, males or females? Females, females. Yep, their heart muscle's just not as strong, you know, as far as thinking of you know, heart rate to meet demands. Um, exercise, more exercise equals lower heart rate. Body temperature, if I have a fever, what's the heart rate looking like? High. And if you've had kids, you know how that is. You pick them up and their heart's just doom, 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 right? All right. Blood pressure then. Uh, this is not what you put on your worksheet. Do not put these on your worksheet. We're going to talk about those in a minute. So what is blood pressure? First of all, it's the force exerted on the walls of a vessel. We can have venous pressure or arterial pressure, so don't just say artery walls because blood pressure can, you know, exerts pressure on the venous side and the arterial side, and capillary pressures, but blood pressure is just the force exerted on the inside of a vessel wall. That's the definition of it. So it's influenced by cardiac output, the amount of blood leaving the heart. Would you agree that that would influence blood pressure? Yeah, so if I have a high cardiac output, how would that affect blood pressure? Increase it. 
peripheral resistance, which is basically what we would call preload or afterload. Which one of those would be related to peripheral resistance? Afterload, the, what I have to overcome to pump out of the heart. So if I have a lot of resistance out there because of blood clots, we said, narrowed vessels, we said, extra blood volume, that's definitely going to affect blood pressure, correct? So would blood pressure go up or down with peripheral resistance? Up. Increase PR, increase blood pressure. And these are questions that you would see on the test. If I give you one, can you predict how that's going to affect the other things? And blood volume. If I have increased blood volume, what's that going to do to blood pressure? Whew. What would it do? Up. Increased blood volume, more pressure, right? If I put more volume in my balloon, what's going to happen to my balloon if I keep filling it with a hose? It's going to burst, right? It's common sense kind of stuff. So if I have a patient that's got a failing heart, so their, their force of contraction is weakening with age, do I want to make sure their blood volume is high or low within reason? I want to keep it lower, don't I? So that it's not working so hard to push that blood. I want to keep the blood volume within a normal amount. So if they're eating something salty, they absorb that salt into their blood. What is the, one of the key phrases of advanced a &P graduates? <laughs> Water follows solute. So if I have salt in my blood from a supersized McDonald's lunch, what does that salt draw into my blood vessels? Water. So what happens to my blood volume? Goes up. What happens to blood pressure? Goes up. So people that are have failing hearts and eating at home, those old-fashioned tasty foods like meatloaf with mashed potatoes and butter and salt and pepper, canned vegetables, right? That's kind of what people traditionally have eaten that are older. Those are bad for the heart, very bad for the heart. They need constant reminding to cut that salt. Diet Pepsi, should we be drinking Diet Pepsi? No, because that's all those diet sodas are high in salt. That's how we improve the flavors, by adding lots of salt to them. So you want to cut the salt. How about drinking? I love lemonade, or I love Kool-Aid, and water, coffee. Well, coffee's OK. It's a little better, because you at least pee some of that away. But do I want to be giving people lots of fluid if they've got a failing heart? No, because that's working their heart more. So some people have, are only allowed 1,500 mils, one and a half liters, or two liters a day of fluid, and that's it. And they're, on, they're chronically thirsty because of that, because they just can't bring in that fluid because it's too hard on their heart. So it's like the lesser of two evils, being a little bit dehydrated versus having your heart fail faster. So as CNAs and nurses, we really got to pay attention to what we're serving our heart failure patients, because they, they'll ask you for more water if you give it to them. You know, so we have to kind of say, well, you know, your fluid restriction is this. They have the right to refuse that. They can say, I don't care. I'm thirsty. You feed me what I want. This is my body, not yours. They have that right. But you still have to encourage them, you know. What? Definitely, yeah. I mean, as far as dehydration, like I said, you're kind of, you have a little bit of dehydration going on, but what's the lesser of two evils? A heart that doesn't work or a little dehydration, you know, yeah. Or how about if I have a patient with failing kidneys and they're not making urine? Because when, when we up our fluid intake, don't we pee away the excess because our kidneys can take care of that? What if I have failed kidneys and my only way to make urine is through the dialysis machine? So between dialysis, that fluid's coming in. That's not going anywhere. So blood pressure's going up. So the kidneys really play a role in blood pressure. And we'll learn that when you study the renal system. So when we look at changes in blood pressure, that is affected by cardiac output and the resistance in the vessels. But I'm not going to um, hold you accountable for that equation, so don't worry about that equation. That's not on the worksheet. So what affects um, blood pressure then? Uh, We have metabolic controls of blood pressure. So we have um, looking at this vessel, the pressure inside this vessel, right? The uh, pressure on the inside of the wall. We have metabolic controls. So we have all these different things that affect blood pressure. And I'm not going to hold you accountable for all these, OK? Just know that they're out there. So nitric oxide, so when I take my um, nitro, someone has you know bad heart right, and they're getting chest pain, they're going to take their nitro, which they carry in a little brown glass container because it's sensitive to sunlight. They take that. 
What does it do? Green means dilate. So that's going to dilate the vessels over the heart. And it's going to allow more blood flow to the heart muscle and hopefully take away that chest pain. Um, carbon dioxide, potassium, those are going to dilate those blood vessels. Constricting, we already talked about some of those. Epinephrine, we know sympathetic stimulation constricts, constricts the blood vessels because of alpha receptors that bind. Um, and where does it constrict those? Because not everywhere, because we see if it's got alpha receptors, they constrict. If it has beta receptors, it dilates. So where do we say beta receptors are? On the heart. So it dilates the coronary blood vessels, but it constricts the vessels to the digestive tract, right? Those other areas that are not as important for fight or flight. So myogenic controls, that just means when I stretch the muscle, or if that <coughs> muscle uh, relaxes, that's going to either inhibit or stimulate myogenic controls. So here we can see stretch is going to constrict those blood vessels. So the blood vessel itself, when it's stretched, constricts. Um, so we talked about nerves. Hormones, quite a few hormones here. Epi, angiotensin II, ADH, those will all increase in the blood when blood pressure falls. The only one that actually lowers blood pressure is ANP. And the walls of the atria, when they're stretched, they, st they release this hormone to, de to decrease blood pressure. So these all <coughs> increase blood pressure because you can see that they, what do they do? They constrict. So if everybody agrees, right? If you constrict a blood vessel, it's going to increase pressure, right? If I want to get a, a, a higher, um, a, a faster flow out of my hose, what do I do? I put my thumb over the end, right, to constrict the space that the water has to come out at the end. I make a smaller opening, and doesn't that shoot the water with more force? So higher blood pressure would be a constricted blood vessel. If I want a lower blood pressure, I dilate the blood vessel. So we have more controls for a low blood pressure than we do for a high blood pressure. So atrial natriuretic peptide is the only hormone in this list that actually stimulates or will be stimulated to be released when we have a high blood pressure. Because which is more dangerous within a five minute period, a low blood pressure or a high blood pressure? Low blood pressure, and why is that? Because why? Because you'll pass out and, and die, right? Because if you don't get oxygen to your brain and your heart muscle itself via the coronary circulation, you're not going to live more than five minutes. So we need to keep that blood pressure up. So we have a lot more controls for hormonally for controlling blood pressure than low blood pressure than we do for high blood pressure. <clears throat> so going back to our worksheet then, blood pressure is the you know force exerted against a vessel wall, normal value for blood pressure. Mother, it's a range, right? So 120 over 80 is kind of in the middle of that range. But we like anything on the top number, it should be over 90, right? And less than 130. And then the bottom number, they kind of change. So diastolic, I don't remember. I can look in our lab book. What is it? 80 to 89. Yeah, that was the value. Is it still that? Because I know we're, we're changing some of those things. Optimal is less than 120, less than 80. So we want less than 80 is ideal for the... Um, but prehypertensive is any systolic that's 120 to 139 and 80 to 89. I'm looking for low. Low values would be um, less than 100. But actually, in practice, we say um, less than 90 is what we're more concerned about <coughs> as a systolic. If it falls less than 90, that's something you want to call the doctor on. OK, so we said that uh, blood pressure was affected by
going back here. So a couple of things. So chemicals and hormones. Did everybody agree with that? So chemicals and hormones. And what were the hormones? What? A and P. So that will lower blood pressure. And then we said ADH, angiotensin 2, and aldosterone raise blood pressure. And the chemicals are said not to worry about so much. And then um, we said stretch of the blood vessel wall. Increased stretch causes constriction. And lastly, we're going to talk about barrel receptors. And we have the two most important barrel receptors are in the aortic arch and carotid sinus which is in the carotid artery. And where are the carotid arteries? <coughs> carotid arteries, where do they run? Up the, side, up the sides of your neck, right? So when you're laying flat, so you're watching TV, you're laying on the floor, laying in bed, and you leap up really fast. Some people, the, the stretch, the receptors in the carotid artery don't respond as quickly to that decreased stretch, because when there's decreased stretch, what happens? Let's look here. So we have low blood pressure, because you just leaped up, right? And your, and your blood vessels kind of redistributed that blood as you were in the lying down position. And then as you leap up, you need to have the gravity is going to allow the blood to go downward and not to your head, so your vessels have to adjust to increase the flow. So what does it want to do? What do the carotid arteries need to do to increase the pressure going to your brain? Constrict or dilate? Constrict. Very important that you understand the relationship between blood pressure and vessel diameter. Constriction increases blood pressure. Say that 10 times to yourself if you are forgetting that. Very, very important. And I hear it every semester in general and advanced. When I ask that question, some people say dilate. And I'm not sure where that's coming from, but it's very important that you understand. We want to when we constrict blood vessels, we increase pressure. And if I constrict them too much, how does that affect blood flow to the tissues? It's decreased if I constrict them too much. But if I increase and constrict them a little bit, that increases blood flow to the tissues because I'm increasing the pressure. So it's kind of you know within a certain um, normal range that we constrict to increase pressure. Okay, so we have low blood pressure, so that inhibits the receptors in the aortic arch, um, stimulates the sympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system is going to increase heart rate, increase contractility. We also have that vasoconstriction happening within the blood vessels themselves. And then um, we have increased heart rate, increased resistance due to constriction, and that's going to raise the blood pressure. So let's look at the opposite. We have too high of a blood pressure. That stimulates those barrel receptors, which goes to the brain, to the medulla, and that's going to decrease sympathetic stimulation. That's going to dilate the vessels, and that's going to bring down cardiac output and resistance and bring our blood pressure back to a normal range. So when are the barrel receptors stimulated? low or high blood pressure? High. So when they're stretched is when barrel receptors in the carotid arch and the aortic, or the aortic arch and the carotid sinus are stimulated, when there's increased stretch. And that is going to stimulate, or it's going to inhibit the sympathetic nervous system. So when you leap up from the couch, these barrel receptors 
are inhibited because there's less stretch, right? And that causes increased sympathetic stimulation. And then automatically those vessels are going to constrict because of the stimulus from the brain saying that we need to increase the response by the body to get blood pressure up. So these things are happening normally, but people end up in the hospital, right, with broken feedback mechanisms. We talked about that in the beginning of the semester. So as we age, these don't work very well, and people get what they call orthostatic, hyper, or orthostatic hypotension, which means they stand up and their blood pressure drops and they pass out. So sometimes they need medication for that. Other times it just means get up slowly. Give your body time for this baroreceptor reflex to fix your low blood pressure. Okay, so we have um, baroreceptors, chemicals, and hormones. Did we list three? So stretch um, within the, which is the, the vasomotor within the vessel itself, just the stretch reflex within the vessel. That's this one. And then we said the baroreceptors and then chemicals and hormones. And I describe this a little differently in my evening class, but we covered all those one way or another. So, And then we have venous return. We talked about that. That's the amount of blood returning to the heart. Normal value should be equal, pretty close to my cardiac output. So what leaves the heart should come back to the heart eventually. Some of it enters the lymphatics, but it does come back to the heart eventually. So what affects venous return? Cardiac output. And I don't know if, if venous return is, is it talked about in your, no. No, they don't do a, good, a great job in your textbook talking about venous return. So how much leaves the heart is going to affect how much comes back to the heart. What else? Someone said it. What was it? What? Blood pressure, definitely. If I have a low blood pressure, is that much going to come back to the heart? No. Blood pressure. What else did somebody say now? I just, thank you. <laughs> Cardiac output. And what else? What? Stretch wear. Okay, kind of throughout, isn't it? Heart muscle too, which is relating to cardiac output. And blood pressure is related to stretch. So what else? What else did we say earlier that affected how much blood could return to the heart? Um, you, what did you say? Yes, blood volume. Blood volume. So this is another thing that we can say alongside all these things is when we look at venous return, what causes blood to return to the heart? So as a sideline, I'm just going to put it over here as a text box because it's an, another important thing to keep in mind, is what causes venous return? What allows, do we have um, muscular venous walls that are pushing the blood back to the heart? Because we know what feeds our tissues. It's the heart contracting in these pressure waves, right? We don't see that. The venous side of our circulation is the low pressure side of our circulation. So what actually helps blood return to the heart is muscle contraction. So we'll say also influenced by muscle contraction and um, when we take a deep breath inhalation when you go <gasps> take a deep breath what happens to your abdomen it goes in right so that compresses the veins your inferior vena cava 
and forces blood toward the heart. So just deep breathing increases venous return. So we have muscle contraction, inhalation, and what else would increase? It's within our control. So we have the skeletal. Um, there's a picture, actually, I'll show you. I'm just trying to look vitamin or venous return up here. Um, venous return, where are you? Yeah, see, it's not even in the back of, well, no, I'm looking in the wrong spot. Venus return. There we go, page 682. There's a nice picture in your textbook. I'll show it to you just so you have a visual. Now I lost the page, darn it. Six eighty two. That's not the thing I was looking for. Hmm. Well, there's a better picture, but on page, page six eighty two, it shows um, the. Let's look here. Uh, right here. So venous return is listed here. So if you look at some other factors, so we talked about the skeletal muscle movement, contraction, respiratory pump, and third thing, what? Heart rate? <laughs> yes. So faster or slower heart rate, right? We talked about that. When we give more time for the heart to fill with blood, right, that's going to increase my venous return, correct? Everybody agree with that? Make sense? Okay. All right, so what does this matter? So if you have your patient, you want to get blood going back to the heart, we want to make sure muscles are contracting. So that's why it's good for people that have a lot of um, fluid in their lower extremities. It's good to get them up and walking because that helps with venous return, helps get that blood flowing back to the heart. Deep breathing exercises helps improve blood flow. So when you use the incentive spirometer, we're not only helping those alveoli, we're also helping blood flow back to the heart and making sure that people aren't working too hard where their heart rate is getting up too high because, again, that's going to decrease that venous return. Okay, and then lastly, looking at types of blood pressure controls. We mentioned a lot of those. That was in the, the PowerPoint here. The metabolic, myogenic, nerves and hormones, those are you know, all ways that we control blood pressure. But we're going to learn um, when we study the urinary system that the kidneys play another big role in controlling blood pressure. And so when you talk about hormones, um, some of them are from the kidneys. So the ADH and angiotensin II um, are influenced by, the, by kidney function. So as we age, our kidney function kind of goes down, so we see a lot of people as they age having blood pressure problems. And we said some metabolic things, some chemicals in the blood affect blood pressure and the stretch of the blood vessel wall, and we said sympathetic stimulation affects blood pressure. So again, hormones chemicals slash metabolic stretch of blood vessel walls and sympathetic stimulation. So if you're chronically stressed because you have lots of things going on in your life, that's hard on the heart. Increases contractility, increases heart rate, and over time, we know that high stress lives are hard on the heart and can lead to hypertension and heart attack. So it's important that we keep our stress under control. So I'm trying to figure out.